everyone, thanks for coming to this presentation. Uh, the topic is deep learning for musical form with condition analysis. And, uh, you know, Dan will tell you more about it. Thank you. All right, we should be good to go. All right, so my thesis topic was deep learning for musical form, recognition, and analysis. Before I get started, I'd first like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Mukherjee, and my committee, Dr. Nguyen, Dr. Oster, and Dr. Wickham, who have all been really helpful throughout the last you know, five years that I've been at Whitewater studying both music and computer science. Um, you know, this has been a, a really big accumulation of really everything I've learned at Whitewater. So an outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll be going through um, just a brief introduction on um, what music form analysis looks like, the motivation behind the paper, our goals, contributions, and things like that, and then the actual um, methodology, implementation, and the evaluation. So musical form analysis, which typically refers to classical music form, um, is a rigorous task that frequently challenges the expertise of human analysts and signal processing algorithms alike. So while numerous systems have been proposed to perform the task of musical segmentation, genre classification, and single label segment uh, classification in popular music, none have really focused specifically on the analytical process used by classical musicians. As well, the current data sets used for related research tasks last, lack standardized analytical conventions, including the form classification and suffer from erroneous annotations and extensibility due to the data sources used for the music. They ended up using typically recordings of live performances rather than be tied to really clear um, something like sheet music or a MIDI file. So we propose a new system to perform the task of automatic music form analysis using deep learning models as well as a new standardized data set. So there are a couple of motivations behind this paper, but first of all, the problem definition the um, several attempts to autonomously analyze and segment musical form using artificial int uh, intelligence algorithms have been made, including novelty methods, community detection algorithms, and neural networks, but none have really proven to be sufficient for this specific task. So there's a few limitations that go along with this. The first of all being current systems focus on popular music tasks, such as verse chorus segmentation and classification um, and genre classification although attempts have been made to segment classical music by phrases without necessarily classifying them. So the only existing data sets of phrase analyzed classical music come from a data set called the Structural Analysis of Large Amounts of Music Information, abbreviated SALAMI, um, which features numerous errors. Uh, it lacks standardized uh, analytical conventions for the purpose of allowing for genre flex flexibility and again, they use live recordings rather than basing timestamps on the actual score for the music itself. And third of all, no such tools exist for automatic or computer-assisted classical form analysis. This time-consuming task must be done entirely by hand, and translating this to an AI-usable format requires a double analysis of both the sheet music and a reliable audio file for timestamping. So with this research, there's a lot of different applications that can be used for this specific type of uh, task. First of all, music rehearsal and pedagogy, um, any sort of music practice and analysis tools such as dividing a piece by themes for rehearsal, assignment generation using peak picking algorithms or a grading system for human analyzed scores, uh, audio thumbnails and fingerprints. Um, audio thumbnail generation is used typically for streaming services or web stores like iTunes, Facebook Music Sharing, and Amazon Music. The picture that I have up on the right is actually from Facebook's audio sharing feature for Spotify and iTunes, which generates a 30-second audio thumbnail of a song that's shared. There's also forensics and copyright detection, so forensic musicology, where the analysis might be used to compare numerous pieces of music for similar or exact replications of musical phrases, motives, or other structures, and audio-video analysis, where we could extend you know, this sort of form analysis to um, apply both visual and audio cues to the media structure, whether it's something that's formal in design, such as a music video, musical, etc., or not, like a movie or TV show. A few additional things. 
we could do um, generalized audio structure analysis, so performing structural analysis on any given audio or waveform, including spoken audio where patterns of repeated language might be used, such as poetry because poetic form is very closely related, uh, forensic investigation, um, lecture, neuro-linguistic programming, and natural language processing problems. There's music sheet recognition analysis um, by optics. So optical sheet music recognition, which is analyzing a piece using the sheet music, much like a human analyst, or correcting optical sheet music transcriptions using the formal structures. We also have audio and spoken language classification. So we could do audio classification by content with or without music, such as for sorting a web database or for hearing impaired accessibility tools or language classification from audio recordings. So something like Google Translate, being able to um, classify what language a person is speaking or something along those lines. And as well, something that plagues musicology is there's a lot of um, lacking uh, musical anthologies, especially regarding uh, music form and analysis-based anthologies alongside other fields of musicology that lack significant research and technical advancement. So Daniel, just a quick question about your motivate about your reasons. Mm -hmm. Are these things available with popular music and just not with classical music? A lot of them, yes. Uh, like um, musical anthologies, I mean, you can really look at any website that has, you know, here's all of these songs. They're basically all in verse chorus form and things like that. Um, optical sheet, uh, optical music recognition. Um, there's a very small number of programs that do this currently. Um, I know of like two commercial ones at the moment, but even then they only really work for sheet music that was either created with you know, a, a transcription program um, and not really with an actual PDF of the score. There's newer models that are coming out to do that sort of thing, but again, there's still a lot of room for correction, especially if there's like, um, like an offset starting beat called anacrusics. Um, anything like that really doesn't work well. Um, Currently, so this could be one potential remedy for something like that. And then most other things are, you know, more general tasks. So the goals and objectives of, of this paper, first of all, we want to provide a new model to perform full form analysis, so form classification, segmentation, and part or phrase labeling, rather than simply peak picking in segmentation and expand upon existing model architecture designs using recurrent memory cells to better recognize repeated audio patterns. Second of all, developing a new musically accurate data set by common analytical conventions, including categorical divisions by a large musical form, and provide appropriate evaluation metrics and accurate model performance results. Third of all, present a more accurate deep learning model to perform both form level and part slash phrase level analysis using suitable algorithms for the network architecture and signal processing by extensive and exhaustive research, and examining the previous work in the field through extensive background research and contributing to the literature by obtaining improved results from previous studies in the formal analysis of music using machine learning and peak picking methods. So I want to give just a brief background on what music form analysis looks like. So, Classical music form analysis facilitates a combination of classification and segmentation tasks, including form classification, structural segmentation, and multi-label large and small segment classification, which are tasks that currently lack feasible algorithms, machine learning models, and really extensive research as well. So in form analysis, we typically break down classical pieces uh, hierarchically by their large form, so two-part or binary, three-part or ternary, there are part divisions, so part A, part B, part A prime development, et cetera, and phrases such as A, A prime, B, C, theme variation, transition, so on. Um, though many additional labels may be employed, including for other substructures. And you know, there's an endless number of different labels that are possible. So form analysis has many applications in the world of music, especially for directors and music teachers in general. And a viable analytical system would greatly benefit performing musicians and academic researchers, both in musicology and signal processing. So one of the greatest difficulties in music analysis is the lack of complete ground truth. Uh, pieces of music are frequently interpreted differently by different analysts and may be classified or even analyzed differently at the phrase or part levels, and sometimes even at the form level as well. So in this example that I have up on the right, 
Um, this is what a typical form analysis would look like on the actual sheet music. So starting at the beginning, we have you know, part A, phrase A. Phrase A goes for four measures, and then we have phrase A prime, which goes for four measures. We get into part B, phrase B. So we can see how the labels um, kind of carry over throughout the whole thing. Just a brief overview of the literature. There wasn't really much that was like truly related to the research that I did, um, but these are the systems that I found to be closest to what I was trying to accomplish. So I give sort of a, a chronological timeline here, starting with um, one of the first papers that I found in 1998 was a melody and harmony generator using feed forward, feed forward neural networks, which ended up being unable to learn higher level musical structures occurring simultaneously and at multiple time scales or recognize melodic versus harmonic context of notes and intervals. In 2007, there was a paper on automatic music style recognition through the classification of harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic transcriptures using K nearest neighbors, self organizing maps, and Bayesian classification. They did note that self organizing maps might be useful for form analysis. So their system was designed to recognize low level features only. And then system three, um, these were a couple different papers that all sort of um, continued off of each other um, in 2014, 15, and 16. Um, this is mostly boundary recognition using convolutional neural networks, the MEL spectrogram, and self-similarity lag matrices to estimate fixed up segmentations based on the salami data, data set annotation levels. And the boundaries were evaluated by time tolerance. This is a similar approach I did for evaluating my own peak picking algorithm. Um, this was also used to generate audio thumbnails. And lastly, uh, most re recently in 2020, there was a paper on automatic musical structure detection and segmentation using multi-resolution -re community detection and graph theory to perform boundary detection and structural grouping, yielding a structural hierarchy. So they wanted to take a non-machine learning approach to try and accompl accomplish the same task because they noted that CNNs will continue to lack improvement without recurrent layers. So the main contributions of our paper, um, we want to develop a system of three components, the form analyzer, a peak picking algorithm, and a phrase analyzer. We use hybrid neural decision tree models to train quickly and reduce overfitting. And we provide a data set built from 200 manually classified MIDIs, augmented with five different sets of permutations, which I'll, um, I'll expand upon, um, to expand the data set to uh, 1,200. So our system components. The form analyzer uh, will classify a classical piece as one of 12 different possible um, common music theory forms. The peak picking algorithm will break down our audio file using onset detection methods to discover the peak event audio frames. And then we'll return the set of frames as a series of timestamps representing the musical phrases. So this is referred to as a novelty vector. We have the phrase analyzer, which uses the form classification and the phrase timestamps to classify each timestamp sequentially. Uh, these timestamps may include multiple labels, such as the part and phrase, or individual labels, such as just transition, phrase, section, and so on. And for the full prediction system, we combine the outputs of all three major components and present a final analysis formatted to match the training data. So the file name, the form, and the labeled timestamps, which you'll see an example of. So this is what the architecture looks like. Um, so I have an ensemble network of neural decision trees. Those are stacked to produce the form output um, using their average prediction. We have the peak picking algorithm, which takes in the MEL spectrogram, chromogram, and converts it to a self-similarity lag matrix. This ends up producing a novelty vector. These red dashed lines are the onsets that it's detected. So we get the series of timestamps back. And then finally, this is put into a bidirectional um, long short-term memory recurrent neural network which takes in the timestamps, the spectrogram for each timestamp, um, and then the form prediction to create our new phrase training data. Um, after being passed through the um, LSTM network, the weights from the dense layer are provided to form the phrase label predictions that train a decision tree, and that decision tree is what provides our final classification. So data extraction and preparation, 
So using feature selection, such as uh, select k best and um, recursive feature elimination uh, methods, we found that the two most important data features for form classification were the music duration and the self-similarity lag matrix of the MEL spectrogram. And I have a picture of that on the right. So it's basically just taking you know, the spectrogram data and overlaying it into a recurrent vector. The data set was augmented using pitch, time, speed, and starting point shifting methods to expand the 200 piece data set to 1200. This data set is publicly available on GitHub for extended contribution. Um, so on the GitHub, I've provided both the, um, all of the MIDIs for the data set as well as um, you know, some guidelines for contributing to the data set so this work can be expanded on in the future. Um, each piece of music was converted to its spectrogram self-similarity lag matrix, and the mean and variance were used to reduce the 2D array into a one-dimensional array. So this is a common approach used for feature scaling and dimensionality reduction in signal processing tasks. And the set of data, um, including the duration and numerous unused pre-calculated features, um, was stored as a data table, a CSV file, for ease of extensibility and reduced computation time during training. So the data for the form analyzer was scaled um, using the data minus the mean over the standard deviation, and the phrase analyzer was scaled using min-max scaling. So for the form analyzer architecture, we per, um, we've used a hybrid deep neural decision forest architecture known as TreeGrad, um, which was used to fit the data set as an ensemble network using stacking. So this model trained extre extremely quickly and fit to the data set with high accuracy and low error. So overfitting was not an issue compared to non-hybrid models, such as a plain convolutional neural network, a dense neural network, and so on. Um, duration was found to be the most important feature in classifying the form, which is a hint well used by human analysts. We can kind of gauge um, you know, what the form might be just based on how long a piece of music is, whether it's a short or large form. Um, labels were encoded using integer encoding, and to combat overfitting using the pruning methods employed by decision trees, TreeGrad models each tree in the ensemble as a three-layer neural network to create a neural decision tree. So each neural decision tree is comprised of a decision or input layer, a node slash routing or hidden layer, which controls the branching of each node in the tree, and a prediction or output layer. And you can see this architecture on the right side here. So we essentially have the same layout as if you rotated a neural network diagram. We have our input layer. Um, the node and routing layers provide our activation functions and essentially act as um, you know, just a typical uh, dense layer. And then we have our final prediction layer at the end. So each tree in the TreeGrad forest uses probabilistic routing computed by the sigmoid function, replicating the, the probabilistic output of a dense neural network. Both the input and dense layers are trainable, allowing the weights of each layer to be bounded by the LP norm with k greater than or equal to 1, which conforms the model to the ADANET generalization bounds. This creates better comparisons between the complexities of the models in an ensemble and the overall training loss. So all trees in the forest are combined into a stacked ensemble where multiple well-performing well models are combined, and then the average of their output is returned as the final prediction. And then down below here, I have the hyperparameters, so um, a learning rate of 0 0.1, 100 estimators, or different trees in the forest, a batch size of 32, and so on. And then on the right here, I have just an example diagram of what the probabilistic routing um, looks like in the neural decision tree modeled as in this case, a convolutional neural network. So you can see how it gives the um, probability output for each of the different classes. So for the peak picking algorithm, um, which is sometimes referred to as onset detection, we use the MEL spectrogram, so just a spectrogram that's scaled to how a human would hear it, and the self-similarity lag matrix chromogram, um, which is a group of pitch class distribution by time to detect peaks in the audio. And that's what I have up in the upper right here is a chromogram. It shows how all of the pitches are grouped together over time. And then the chromogram is computed using k-nearest neighbors to, clutches, uh, to cluster pitches in the MEL spectrogram. The computed vector of peaks represented by audio frames captured by the short time Fourier transform, or STFT, is returned as an array of timestamps. So while the algorithm does not employ machine learning techniques to perform the peak, picking, uh, peak detection directly, it was found to be comparable to other CNN architectures discovered in the literature review, 
and greatly reduced system design time given the lack of uh, training necessary to perform the calculations. So over on the right here, I also have an example output of the novelty vector. So these red dashed lines represent the timestamps predicted by the peak picking algorithm, and the black lines are the ground truth. So there's a really close correlation between what I've labeled and versus what the um, algorithm has detected. And a lot of these, either they're offset by a few seconds or there's a couple additional labels that either I included or the model included that are, you know, they're, they're subjective. Um, so the phrase analyzer architecture, um, which we dubbed as LSTM tree, uh, the data for the phrase analyzer is divided into a series of timestamps, which are used to splice the audio into segments between these points. Um, the features selected for the phrase analyzer include the form classification, the timestamp, the duration of the audio slice, and the mouse spectrogram of that audio slice. So prediction requires both an accurate form prediction and peak picking results which increases the difficulty of the task. So labels were encoded using one hot encoding. The model is implemented using a hybrid architecture. In this case, it is a bidirectional LSTM, which is a form of recurrent neural network, um, is used to fit the data. Then the output of the last hidden or dense layer is used to fit a decision tree to perform the final prediction. So we refer to this as LSTM tree. And again, I have the hyperparameters down below. So the main things are um, we have four recurrent units for the LSTM. Um, we end up using binary cross entropy for the loss function, sigmoid activation, and uh, the atom optimizer. And then on the right side here, I have an example of what the, the MEL spectrogram looks like. This is a really good example of what a spectrogram looks like over time. Um, some of them can be kind of fuzzy as to what they're really describing, but this is a really good example of um, how the spectrogram correlates to the pitch distribution over time. So this is what it would look like unclustered compared to a chromogram. And then I also have the reduced label set. So to reduce the complexity of the model, I ended up reducing the label set to just um, the things that are provided. So the large parts can be A through D, theme variation, coda, and then silence. Um, the phrases were cut down um, instead of being A, A prime, A double prime, so on and so forth. We just reduce it to A. Um, we have transition, codetta, and section, which it was abbreviated as just sec. And then we have uh, theme variations. Um, so we have characteristic, figural, melodic, ornamental, and simplifying. Um, again, there's many more labels that could have been including, uh, included in this, but just to reduce the complexity for things like sonata form, um, we just reduce it to what the equivalent ladder would be. And then this is just an example of what a um, bidirectional LSTM architecture would be. So in evaluating um, for the form analyzer, the tree grab model simply takes in the um, self-similarity matrix and the duration of a piece of music and outputs the predicted classification, which is compared against the, the ground truth label. For a musicologist, this system alone could be used to discover when and why a composer may choose a particular form over another, um, you know, for just as an example of one thing that they might look into using um, that specific designation. Uh, while the peak picking algorithm was not evaluated using a formal metric, the algorithm was tested against the training data and the output timestamps were found to be, you know, nearly identical or they had a low enough difference to be subjectively true, uh, similar to human bias. And lastly, using the timestamps provided by the peak picking algorithm and the labels output from the phrase analyzer, the piece of music can be score studied or analyzed with the sheet music much quicker for rehearsal and research use, for example. So in evaluating the form analyzer, the full, in this case, the augmented data set was split into 83.1% training and 16.9% testing or validation data. Um, this was just found by trial and error as to what ended up giving the best accuracy. The form analyzer was evaluated using both validation accuracy, in this case the Jacquard score, as well as precision, recall, and F1 scores. The final model solely uses the tree grad model to perform the prediction. Um, the mouse spectrogram for prediction is just calculated on the fly and then passed to the model along with the duration. And then the output provided by the prediction is the large form classification expected by the model which was found to be 83% accurate, 
which is surprisingly good um, performance given the subjective nature of the form classification. So our first result was the final form analyzer model achieved a maximum accuracy of 83%. Precision and, re and recall were closely related to this score as well. Um, but this may perform better as, I suppose, an ensemble of ensembles. Um, there's a few different ways that, you know, that could be improved potentially with um, additional models. And then this is just an example of the output from the form analyzer. I just put a bunch of MIDI files in a folder and gave it the directory. And this is what it takes um, and produces. So it tells me that I'm performing a prediction on a certain piece of music, and it outputs the predicted form. In this case, I would say that basically all of these are, are accurate, or at least debatably accurate. So this is a really good example of the form analyzer at, I suppose, its best. So compared to other methods, there were a lot of different models that I attempted in developing this architecture. I tried a 2D convolutional neural network, a 2D CNN ensemble network, of various different forms, a one-dimensional CNN. I tried using AutoCaris to try and um, you know, automatically search for the best model. Um, I tried making a neural support vector machine, um, gradient-boosted neural networks, uh, deep, uh, deeply jointed neural networks. Um, that's a form of hybrid uh, neural decision tree, an actual neural decision tree. And then finally, TreeGrad was our best method with 83% accuracy. Um, and then when I was testing this, I used a decision tree just as sort of a baseline as to how accurate I could get using um, sort of the, the noise of the current data set. I was able to get a decision tree to 84%, but obviously my intention was to create a deep learning model um, that could perform equally well because I wanted something that was trainable. Um, and luckily with the tree guide architecture, we can specify you know, the learning rates and things like that. So it's a truly trainable deep architecture. And then again, the form analyzer reached 84% precision, 83% jacquard accuracy, and 82% recall and F1 scores. So compared to the best um, convolutional neural network that I was able to achieve, um, the best CNN was able to get 50% accuracy, 56% precision, 44% recall, and 41% F1. Again, compared to over twice that for the tree grad model. Um, the CNN, for whatever reason, a standard deep learning architecture just was not feasible alone. Um, you can see the, the confusion matrix on the left side. Um, the data ended up basically always overfitting, even at 50% accuracy. Most of the time, it just learned to guess that Sonata form was probably an OK guess. Um, whereas the tree grad confusion matrix is almost all along the diagonal. So the actual versus predicted is very, very pure in this case, which is exactly what we hope for. And a lot of the times, being 83% accurate, you know, a lot of these are, again, subjective. So you know, we could say that this is subjectively true or not. So the peak picking algorithm. Um, the authors of the full algorithm proposed further modifications for segment-to-segment -segment comparisons, but these greatly increase the number of matrix computations and end up adding substantial overhead. And it already takes a fairly decent time to run, so trying to reduce that time was important for the prediction system. Um, the results, anyway, were found to be identical for almost all pieces of music, regardless of the proposed additions. Um, since the timestamps are independent of the classification analysis, a segment-to-segment -segment comparison is unnecessary for on onset detection. Um, if this was being used specifically for um, form analysis solely just by itself, that would be a different story. But in this case, we just want the timestamps returned. And so we can cut down on the amount of uh, computations needed for this algorithm. So the output of the novelty function was compared to numerous hand-labeled pieces from the data set. And we found that the difference was negligible. So this is a demonstration of the peak picking algorithm compared to my own ground truth annotations. And for a six minute piece of music, the absolute time difference average was plus or minus 14 seconds. And I would say that this is really good, especially for a piece that's this long. And um, considering I literally just compared these um, side by side based on the number of timestamps, again, it might detect a different number of timestamps compared to my own um, so, you know, if I were to compare it based on how close the, um, you know, the timestamps were to each other, you know, that would be an even smaller difference. 
So based on our comparisons, it was more feasible and both faster and accurate to use the algorithm rather than to train a CNN to perform the same task. Uh, one issue the algorithm does face is that some pieces of music that are exceptionally short in duration only return the onset of the start and end of the piece. Uh, for such examples, um, there's a Chopin prelude that's like 37 seconds long. Um, we end up just taking the halfway points, in this case, duration divided by two, and we add that to the novelty vector. So we have the um, start, the halfway points, and then the end as our final result for um, just a really short piece of music. So our second result, the peak picking algorithm proved comparable to other machine learning approaches such as CNN and self-organizing maps as even pre-labeled data points were nearly identical to those marked by a human analyst. So there were a number of associated challenges with evaluating the phrase analyzer. Um, so this model is much more difficult to score programmatically because a number of uh, factors affect the final system. The model receives the timestamps from the peak picking algorithm, which again is also difficult to compare to the human annotated ground truth due to integrative disagreement. Uh, the labels are often highly subjective and some labels are implicit. Um, something like part A continues until timestamp N, but is only labeled at the first occurrence. Um, and I mentioned here, it, it achieved a 100% accuracy in terms of Hamming score on the training set. Um, this was the closest way that we could get to um, evaluating that performance. Um, this was different between different models that we tried, so that was at least a sure sign of that. Um, this is just a full example of um, a, just a typed out analysis. So you can see how section A branches over measures one through eight in this piece of music, but in this case, you know, we would only label um, section A once, even though it's also covering phrase A, phrase B, the extension, and so on. And again, we only label the first occurrence of phrase B, or part B in phrase A prime, and so on and so on. So, you know, in labeling this, it could be, um, you know, if someone were to extend this, they could easily carry the large form label across each, um, you know, applicable timestamp. But in this case, we wanted it to be as true to real, real analysis as possible. Additionally, uh, form analysis, especially onset detection, operates on fuzzy logic rules, so not yes or no. So the peak picking algorithm and the phrase analyzer may or may not be considered accurate based on the bias of a human analyst and or their uh, analytical conventions. If the data set was put into a test set, the results would likely be less truthful of the model's performance due to poor generalizing, um, just based on the data set being too small to split well into training and testing proportions. However, expanding the data set would require many analysts all trained on either the same or at least similar methodology of analyzing each piece individually uh, before reaching an agreement for the ground truth labels. And also two analysts may even label varying numbers of events. So this is what the final prediction output looks like for the entire system. So in this case, it prints out what the name of the piece is. That's just a given. Um, in this case, it guessed that it was ternary form, which for this piece of music I would say is correct. And then I left in um, the decision tree for comparison. Again, I used the decision tree just to gauge how accurate the model was. And then I used TreeGrad, but I left it in just to show. Um, TreeGrad only supports single label classification. And again, it's very clearly overfit. Um, so it doesn't really work well trying to reduce all of these multi-labels into a single label set. So this is what the label set looks like for each of these different timestamps. So starting at, again, part A, phrase A, um, I'll talk about what these um, kind of imply later on. Um, it gets to part B and phrase B, section, and so on. Coda kind of comes out of nowhere. So again, there's a couple things that are um, accurate and inaccurate in parts of the results. So you, I guess you could gauge the, the accuracy between you know, each individual timestamp um, if you wanted to look at it that way. Um, the results of the phrase analyzer, while there was currently little room for improving the model outside of manually expanding the data set. Um, after optimizing hyperparameters, we found that the output of the model was objectively comparable to our ground truth analyses. Um, as such, the model is practical enough to be used as an assisting tool for human analyses, such as for expanding the data set, and was thus considered as good as currently possible. So given the evaluation constraints for the phrase analysis, we found that the LSTM tree was sufficient to 
avoid harsh overfitting compared to other attempted models such as DNN, RNN, and tree grad, which is likely a result of the boosting that it gets from the decision tree. So again, I'll, I'll mention um, being able to expand the data set currently would require me to hand analyze the score, which requires listening over and over to the, the audio to make sure that um, I have timestamps correctly and things like that at the correct um, uh, portion in time and whether or not something is repeated. And then again, I have to go through and listen to it another few times and label each timestamp on a separate data file. So it requires a double analysis, which can take you know, an hour, maybe two hours or more per piece of music, even for a piece of music that's five to six minutes long. So it's quite an extensive process. So to be able to at least break down you know, a rough estimate, this is a really good example. Um, this is just a rough example of what uh, this sort of segmentation looks like for popular music. Um, this is an example of um, verse chorus form that someone analyzed using a, a word to vec model. Um, so you can see how the, seg uh, the self similarity matrix sort of gives you a rough idea as to, you know, here's the verse, here's the bridge, here's the chorus. You know, you can kind of look at the overlapping recurrent sections um, and classify them from there. So other machine learning algorithms such as random forest and extra trees were attempted, but they provided either unusable or highly overfit output due to the multi-label classification. Uh, the LSTM tree also appears to prioritize the large form labels, as you might have noticed, and often tends to leave out the phrase label or generalizes it as a section without giving it a unique letter. So result number three, uh, in comparison to other models, LSTM tree outperformed both individual neural networks uh, machine learning algorithms, and tree grad. And lastly, using a hybrid neural network decision tree approach greatly reduced overfitting and thus increased accuracy for both form and phrase analyzers. So a few points of discussion. Uh, the LSTM tree may benefit from using a curriculum learning approach, uh, much like that of a traditional form and analysis class. Um, there's a couple different ways that someone could take this, such as um, you know, training either from you know, the easiest data to the hardest or using something like teacher-student curriculum learning where one really accurate is, met, is used to train a bunch of um, less accurate models in the curriculum style. So that might be one way to improve it. Um, also an autoencoder or sequence-to-sequence -sequence model might be useful in creating a more accurate or faster system. Um, but I found that this is what worked best for the task that I developed. Second of all, the final form neural network system is currently accurate enough to be implemented as the backend of a higher level system, such as an assisted grading tool for human analyzed scores or a musical practice tool. The peak picking algorithm could be used to train a more accurate music segmentation network, allowing the entire system to be treated as one large deep learning system, um, which is based off of you know, how a lot of things in the literature review were done. They ended up training a neural network using um, the Salami data set to perform the peak picking. Um, in this case, this algorithm, with how accurate it is, it could be used to train a network itself, um, which would save on having to hand label each piece of music. Um, and then lastly, the current data set features class imbalance. Um, and right now, anthologies of classical music classified by form are lacking, um, though this system could be used to assist in compiling such a work. So again, there's a lot of lacking research in musicology, and music anthology research is always something that's ongoing. There's a lot of research always being done trying to classify pieces, provide analyses, and things like that. So, in conclusion, we've devised a system for the task of automatic music form recognition and analysis using hybrid neural network decision tree models. Uh, the system completely analyzes a piece of classical music, including locating the points of musical events, labeling them by their structural classification, and classifying the piece by its large form structure. We presented a new data set that seeks to correct the errors uh, presented by previously commonly used data sets, including pre-computed spectral data, uh, which I left in for training purposes, and the form classification for each piece. So I basically pre-computed all of the data for the training set, so you know, for future research, this is already ready to go. And extensibility, the final system is in a usable state for individual use, anthology development, or implementation into a more complex piece of software. So in this thesis, we proposed a new system to perform the task of automatic music form analysis using deep learning models, as well as a new standardized data set. 
So there were a few additional suggestions that I had with this research, and I'm, I'm hoping that this is continued later on with the um, contribution guidelines that I've provided, um, whether it be myself or you know, additional um, you know, crowdsourced researchers. First of all, while the current system is specific to classical music analysis, it could easily be extended to allow for the classification of additional forms, including those found in popular music, things like jazz or you know, first chorus form, or uh, more complex hybrid forms, such as sonata rondo or the capo aria, things like that. Um, second of all, optical music recognition is another difficult task, again, that lacks substantial research. Uh, our methods could be potentially expanded to perform visual music analysis and perform these segment, uh, segmentation and classification on the score itself, um, just like a human analyst would. And last of all, this system may be extendable for use in forensic musicology, using the system's output analysis in the comparison of multiple pieces of music for potentially similar or exact replications of musical phrases, whether that be based on the form, based on you know, a series of phrases based on the timestamps, or by their label themselves. You know, there's a lot of different guiding information that could be used for that. And here's my references, we'll just cycle through these. Do I have any questions? Thank you for your talk. Thank you. I have one. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting that uh, duration of the piece was identified as a key feature. Uh, any speculation as to why that might have been? Like, duration was identified and that some other promising scene features might not have been? Um, I was really surprised by that myself. I ended up using. Um, using select K best to narrow down what the most important features were. Um, and based on, you know, using that to fit a decision tree, I had a base model decision tree, a dummy classifier, and then the select K best decision tree. I used recursive feature elimination, but that ended up being about the same. Um, and plotting the feature importance pretty much always gave me that the duration was the most important, followed by, um, you know, the, the actual spectral data itself. Um, so again, you know, using the duration, that's something we can sort of guess, like if it's a piece of music that's a minute long or something like that, we can pretty easily gauge that it's probably binary form or some really short form or something and like a that. A one minute piece is probably not in Sonata. Right, 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 exactly. So I thought that that was really interesting that it had sort of a similar intuition as what a human analyst would. So it just kind of happened to work out that way, interestingly enough. Yeah. So I was wondering um, what is the motivation behind using the decision tree in your uh, models? Um, as like the baseline model or as the connected model? As a connected model. Um, just because of, um, again, you know, I tried all of these different architectures. Um, let's see if I can f swing back to it really quickly. I ended up trying all of these different architectures and just by themselves, these were the absolute best models that I could get from um, all of these different architectures that I tried. You know, I tried CNNs, I tried um, deep neural networks and dense neural networks. I tried a recurrent neural network. These were the best scores that I could get just from a single model by itself. But the decision tree always ended up giving me a better and better score. You know, even, um, you know, increasing the uh, training testing split for cross-validation, the decision tree always gave me a really accurate score. And, and I ended up getting 84% accuracy with that. So I knew that there had to be some sort of tie-in based on you know, the way that the rules are set up for um, you know, branching and routing in the decision tree. You know, there has to be some way that I could have exploited that to get a more accurate classification yeah. model. Um, the CNN, even on the augmented data set, um, it was able to get 50% on the unaugmented data set, but on the augmented data set, I could only get it back up to, I think, like 43%. I tried grid searching for um, optimal hyperparameters. I tried manually tuning them for literal months on end. And as soon as I switched to using a hybrid model, I basically instantly got 83% accuracy. So Daniel, on the same topic, did you analyze like the decision this was making? Like, was there a way to look at that? Like what features it was using to split and you know, that kind of yeah, yeah, I had a, I had a couple files, um, I think, that are, I think, in the GitHub. Um, I printed out just the output of what, you know, um, since it's a forest, I, I, print, I printed out what the graph of 
like the first decision tree in the model looks like. Um, so that was where another thing where I got that the duration was the more important feature. You know, I look at, okay, it says that if the duration is, you know, above something and then if the first spectrogram data is above a certain value, then it's probably this class. I see. So then, you know, again, chaining 100 of those with about, I think, 31 branches per, um, per decision tree in the forest, you know, that was able to get a much more accurate result it seems there. like maybe making more discrete decisions is better for this kind of data than, you know, CNN, which would probably weigh everything, you know, and try, try to find out the weight and things like that. Right, right, exactly. It just ended up working out the best, and I was really surprised with that. I thought that using a CNN would be the first thing that I tried right off the bat. I tried giving it, you know, images of the spectrogram data and things like that. Um, I tried with and without the duration, and taking out the duration of the piece actually ended up decreasing the accuracy overall. Um, so, you know, using the, the rule system that the decision tree implied, it just happened to end up working out the absolute best. So that was pretty exciting that the hybrid method was more, um, more valuable in this case than just a plain deep learning method. So that might be something that I look into more in you know, future research as well. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, it might be worthwhile to see the chain of decisions that the decision tree is making. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, yes, the model. And also, decision tree is, um, I, I, this is why I asked the question, because the, the deep learning in decision tree is like a two spectrum of the explaining uh, capability. So mm -hmm. one is like we love with the white model, the other one is pretty much the black models. And I, I, I like the way that you combine it here. Um, so um, maybe something in the data set itself is suitable for for that decision trees, you know, when the entropy is it's looking good. Yeah. Um, the balance of the data is also one way to explain why it's better in your experiment. Right, and that's, that's something that I thought as well was, um, I tried using class weighting because, you know, in, in music, it's much easier to find a piece of music that's in sonata form than something like arch form or bar form. Um, it's, it's much harder to find, especially on anthologies that list pieces in those forms. So there was always going to be a huge class imbalance between, you know, there's sonata and rondo, and then there's a really small number of much smaller forms and things like that, like menu and trio and theme and variation. Um, so that was one of the things that I thought was um, more beneficial for a decision tree was to use it for the fact that it's imbalanced. Um, it just happened to work out better that way. Any other questions? Yeah, I think I have told him that this is like you have uh, like a PhD thesis worth of problems here. So right, yes. take it forward. Yeah, okay. you know, yeah. that's very good. Yeah. One. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we will meet the thesis committee and meet briefly to discuss, and then if you can stick around and talk. Yeah. Thank you so much.